Henry Kissinger is one of the most prominent retired U.S. politicians alive today, the national security advisor of Richard Nixon and secretary of state of General Ford is still asked to comment on every question concerning U.S. foreign and security policies. He's even appeared as a character on The Simpsons. It was fun. Well, I'll let you know if your glasses turn up. Uh, yes, well, I'm sure I left them in the car. No one must know I dropped them in the toilet. Not I, the man who drafted the Paris Peace Accords. In this regard, Kissinger is famous for establishing diplomatic relationships with communist China and brokering peace deals in Vietnam. He was even awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for the latter in 1973. However, this will show you a different side of the praised politician. You will see that despite his fame, Kissinger committed and ordered several gross human rights violations that could get him prosecuted in international tribunals. Kissinger may have sabotaged peace talks designed to end the Vietnam War for his personal gain. In 1968, after a decade of fighting in the Vietnam War, the United States was exhausted and bitterly divided. There were riots and protests against its involvement, and the president, Democrat Lyndon B. Johnson, had become hugely unpopular. Johnson therefore decided to try and negotiate an agreement between his North Vietnamese enemies and South Vietnamese allies that would end the war. For that purpose, he helped set up peace talks in Paris where the deal could be hammered out. If the talks had been a success, the war could have ended there. Yet it is very likely that one man present, a certain Henry Kissinger, was actively engaged in making them fail. At the time, Kissinger was working as an expert on Vietnam for the U.S. negotiation team. But although he was working for Johnson's team, he was also secretly working with Johnson's political opponent, Republican Richard Nixon. During the talks, Kissinger was feeding Nixon inside information on the progress of the deals. Nixon, as it were, recognizes talent when he sees it. He doesn't like Jews. He doesn't like intellectuals. But he loves Henry Kissinger, because Kissinger knows what to do without being told. Richard Nixon himself says that he admired Kissinger for his ability to supply secret information. Kissinger had a very conspiratorial and sometimes manipulative character. He really liked to please various sides. He liked to ingratiate himself. And in the Paris peace talks, he was willing to talk about the Johnson-Humphrey camp as well as the Nixon camp. His hope was that if the talks failed, Nixon would stand a strong chance of winning the next election. Why did he do this? Because although Kissinger was guaranteed a job in Johnson's Democratic administration, he thought he could get a better one working with Nixon. He was getting information from both sides. He probably was giving information to both sides too. And I don't blame him. I mean, after all, he was not sure which side's gonna win. Whoever win, he's gonna go to their side. His sabotage helped the peace talks to fail and Nixon to become president. Thanks to Kissinger's information, Nixon was able to persuade the South Vietnamese that he could get them a better deal than the Democrats. So they pulled out of the talks just days before the presidential election. The failure of the talks helped sway the election for Nixon, and his first appointment happened to be his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger. As a result of Kissinger's desire for personal gain, the Vietnam War raged on for another seven years, costing the lives of several hundred thousand more people. Kissinger was involved in operations around Vietnam that led to the deaths of thousands of civilians. In his role as national security advisor, Kissinger was heavily involved in the planning of two huge military strategies, Operation Speedy Express and Operation Menu, both of which can be described as war crimes. First of all, Operation Speedy Express deliberately targeted civilians. This mission used the Army and Air Force to clear the Mekong Delta in southern Vietnam of enemy troops. The Americans only found 748 enemy weapons afterwards, and about 11,000 Vietnamese died in the operation. It is highly unlikely that 15 enemy soldiers shared one rifle. We must assume that many of the people killed were civilians. And it has even been argued that the huge number of civilian casualties was a deliberate attempt to boost the body count and subdue the area. Then there's Operation Menu, where the United States breached the neutrality of two states and killed many innocent civilians. During Operation Menu, large waves of B-52 bombers bombarded targets in Vietnam's neighboring countries, Cambodia and Laos. But neither of these states were at war with the United States, so the latter violated international law by attacking them. Moreover, attacking targets from the air with B-52s could not avoid civilian casualties. The planes flew too high to determine whether the targets were military or civilian, so they simply carpet-bombed without accurately measuring where the bombs would land. As a result of the sustained bombing campaigns, about 350,000 civilians died in Laos and 600,000 in Cambodia. 
Not many people know that the history of Latin America is peppered with U.S. interventions and invasions with the intention of installing leaders loyal to Washington. Perhaps the most famous of these was the United States' role in the 1973 overthrow of Salvador Allende, the democratically elected leader of Chile. Allende, who was a Marxist and therefore seen as an enemy of the United States, had been the target of U.S. plots since his election in 1970. And behind many of these plots and eventual coup was Kissinger. When Allende was first elected, the U.S. authorities pressed the Chilean military to intervene, but their leader, General Schneider, refused. Schneider believed that the army should not get involved in politics, and that if Allende had been elected, then he should be supported. So when Schneider blocked their attempts to remove Allende, the United States decided to get rid of Schneider. The senior military officer, General René Schneider, is thought of as the principal obstacle to a military coup because he believes the Chilean armed forces take their oath only to the Constitution. Kissinger had the CIA supply machine guns to two different groups of army officers and paid them $35,000, a huge sum of money in 1970, to kidnap Schneider. They thought they would provoke the military into uh, declaring martial law, suspending the election. But in the end, they didn't kidnap him, they murdered him. With Schneider gone, the military led by General Pinochet could now be convinced to launch a coup against Allende, which they did in 1973. After the coup, Allende supporters were viciously slaughtered in a political murder spree all across Chile and South America. In Operation Condor, many dictatorial regimes in Latin America joined forces to torture, abduct, and assassinate dissidents across the borders. And the intelligence to find and murder these dissidents was helpfully supplied by the CIA. All throughout the operation, Kissinger kept himself updated about what Pinochet was doing, and although he never spoke about it, he often declared his friendship with the military dictator. Kissinger can be linked to genocide and regime change in Bangladesh. In 1971, Bangladesh attempted to break free from the union with Pakistan and become an independent country. The Pakistanis resisted, and that's when Kissinger got involved. He supported the Pakistani government in fighting against Bangladeshi independence. Why? Well, because Pakistan was being governed by a military regime that was a close ally, or client state, of the United States. It was also a vital secret communication link between China and the United States. Kissinger went out of his way to ensure that he fully supported his ally against Bangladeshi independence leader Sheikh Mujib, who wanted to make Pakistan a non-aligned state, specifically one that wasn't allied with either the U.S. or the USSR. In this enraged anti-communist Kissinger. So Kissinger intervened and had the United States arm and equip Pakistani forces, which then went on to commit atrocities in Bangladesh. Pakistan invaded Bangladesh and its forces committed what has been described as genocide. 10,000 people were murdered in the first three days, and some estimate the final death toll as 3 million. But things didn't end there. Even after Bangladesh eventually did gain independence, Kissinger worked to undermine its elected government. In 1975, Mujib, the Bangladeshi leader, was assassinated along with 40 members of his family in a military coup. The coup was heavily supported by the CIA, and it's likely that Kissinger himself played an important role in its planning. While the United States wasn't directly active there, as it was in Indochina, Kissinger certainly guided and supported his Pakistani friends in their mission to disrupt the undesirable state of Bangladesh. Kissinger allowed and assisted the Indonesian dictator Suharto to invade East Timor and commit war crimes. On December 6, 1975, Henry Kissinger was in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, meeting with their president Suharto. The very next day, Indonesian forces rolled into the neighboring nation of East Timor and took it over. In the following years, 200,000 people, a third of the population of East Timor, died in the occupation. So just what did Kissinger and Suharto discuss the day before? Even though he denies it, it's very likely that Kissinger knew about Suharto's plans to invade. Kissinger always explained that he was only informed of the attack at the airport as he was leaving. We were told at the airport as we left Jakarta that either that day or the next day they intended to uh, take East Timor. Yet journalists have obtained evidence under the Freedom of Information Act that clearly shows that Kissinger gave Suharto a green light to invade. One week after this interview, the transcript of the meeting with Suharto was released. Suharto, I would like to speak to you, Mr. President, about another problem, Timor. We want your understanding if we deem it necessary to take rapid or drastic action. Ford, we will understand and will not press you on this issue. 
We understand the problem you have and the intentions you have, Kissinger. You appreciate that the use of US-made arms could create problems. It depends on how we construe it, whether it is in self-defense or is a foreign operation. It is important that whatever you do succeeds quickly. We would be able to influence the reaction in America if whatever happens, happens after we return. It became clear relatively quickly that Suharto's troops were committing massacres. Nevertheless, the United States strongly supported the Indonesian cause. Kissinger even advocated greater U.S. weapon exports to Indonesia and doubled military aid after the invasion. And although U.S. law forbade Suharto to use U.S. supplies for anything except defense, a report showed that this law was ignored. Almost all the equipment used in the East Timor invasion was supplied by the United States. A lot of people are being killed, I repeat, indiscriminately. With no cameras to witness the invasion, a radio transmission from the Red Cross is the only live record of the horror of the event. What I saw was that my own government was very much involved in uh, what was going on in East Timor. Why, they ask, are the Indonesians invading us? Why, they ask, if the Indonesians believe that Fretland is communist, do they not send a delegation to Dili to find out? Why, they ask, are the Australians not helping us? When the Japanese invaded, they did help us. Why, they ask, are the Portuguese not helping us? We're still a Portuguese colony. Who, they ask, will pay for the terrible damage to our homes? One day after this report, Greg Shackleton was killed in East Timor. The fact that Kissinger does not include this dark chapter of his political career in his own autobiography shows that he actively avoids discussing his role in the genocide of the East Timorese population. Kissinger still personally profits from his actions long after leaving public office. Some people who recognize the allegations we've mentioned so far might say that it was all excusable, simply power politics and Cold War times. But things get even murkier once you see that Kissinger turned his policies into cash in his later years. After his active political career, Kissinger founded Kissinger Associates, a company powered by Kissinger's personal network that advises clients on gaining market access worldwide. And there are several examples of Kissinger Associates deals directly linked with dubious political decisions Kissinger made in his years in office. Take China, for example. Kissinger has always been apologetic of the regime, especially after the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. Despite the horrific murder of thousands of people, he stood by the Chinese government and argued against international sanctions. And today, helping American companies to get a hold in China's market is one of Kissinger Associates' main sources of income. An even darker example is Indonesia. Remember how he helped Suharto conduct his massacre in East Timor? Well, in 1991, Kissinger was back and he formed a joint venture with the Indonesian government to exploit a gigantic gold and copper mine located in the archipelago of East Timor. You don't need to be much into conspiracy theories to see that there is something fishy about Kissinger Associates and its sources of income. But surely, sparing a dictator and supporting a regime here and there isn't too bad an idea if you want to do business in their countries later on. If held up to the standards of other war criminals, Kissinger would have already been put on trial. Imagine if the president of an African country had helped assassinate his foreign adversaries, delivered arms to military groups committing genocide, and deliberately killed thousands of civilians in wars he personally waged. There's no doubt about it. There would be international uproar and probably some kind of tribunal. Yet, if you do all this and you are Henry Kissinger, you're praised as the godfather of diplomacy instead. In his positions as National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, he was always in a position to know about all covert actions of the CIA and his foreign allies. He also chaired the 40 Commission, a secret government group that supervised and planned covert missions such as the assassinations of General Schneider in Chile and Mujib in Bangladesh. Finally, the bombing campaigns against civilians in Indochina can also be directly traced back to his orders. There is clearly a double standard at play. When the United States prosecuted Japanese generals after the Second World War, they were executed for giving commands very similar to those Kissinger did in Vietnam. But although there is enough evidence to charge Kissinger, the United States refuses to stand by international law. Kissinger's crimes could be taken up under international human rights law, criminal law, and even domestic U.S. laws forbidding abduction and murder. However, the U.S. administration hypocritically only demands justice when other countries are committing the crimes. Its own representatives are almost immune to prosecution. 